editor Chris here. I'm just letting you know that this is one of the first episodes, so the audio isn't as great as we want it to be. And also, we are plugging things that happened months ago. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I hope you can forgive us, and I hope you can enjoy the episode as is. I promise we get better in the future. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome y'all to Backwoods Obscura, a podcast dedicated to the lore, legends, and myths surrounding the creatures that may lurk in your backyard. My name's Hewitt. I'm Chris. Hey Chris, what's up man? Weekend, a little bit tired, but you know, just making it. How are you doing? Tired but good. Yeah. Uh, Usual thing if you've been listening. Yeah, uh, newborn. Baby. Newborn. Uh, also getting stuff together for extra life. Uh, I'm doing the most of the, well, actually you're going to help me. We're going to be doing the, the, the staging. Yeah. The, we're going to be doing a build sometime soon. We are definitely not on the level of like critical role or any of these other big productions, but I think that we really stepped it up this time. I think, I think it's going to be pretty good as long as we actually get it together. Mm. And that's the reason we'll, we'll get a planning crew beforehand, but I got, I got a good one for you tonight. I honestly, we record these like back to back and I have no idea because we've already done two so far. I am ready. (laughs) All right. So, uh, have you ever heard of the Gates of Guinea? You know, I haven't. Okay. Well, a lot of the information I got here is coming from Atlas Obscura as well as Ancient Origins. Uh, Limited on my research abilities because it's between uh, bottles and classes when I get this off. But... I want you to understand the Gates of Guinea are very important for the hoodoo or voodoo f- faith. And I'm going to try to be the most respectful that I can here yeah. about it because it is an actual religion. It's not just a hot sauce or a gimmick on a t-shirt or a doll you buy in the French or, or, or some flavoring in a Disney movie. or Exactly. Or... Although I hear, I haven't seen Princess and the Frog, but I hear it's actually pretty good. It, it's They do pretty good. But, uh, so, Guinea is the voodoo afterlife. Um, And it's not a heaven or a hell kind of place. It's a spiritual holding spot. It's it's where you go before you either get trapped there or you get to go back across the deep water to your ancestors. So it's kind of like a like a field of reed situation or Yeah, a little bit. It's not like in Egypt you you pass through and you ha- you get your judgment and you either get thrown in the field or yeah. you go on to the afterlife. Pretty much, yeah. But almost dead on with that because uh, this is also the realm of Baron Samedi or Samedi, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Now, uh, what happens is he comes to claim you and take you back and lets you piss him off. And then you can become, a, like in the, the zombie episode I mentioned, if he decides he's not helping you, you're going to become an astral zombie. You're going to be put in a bottle and be Pokeball uh, and used as a good luck charm for somebody or drank to help uh, for performance in certain activities. Uh, that, that's the real hell to me. I, I don't want to be the, the five hour energy drink for somebody. No, no. Uh, so uh, there are seven gates that are either metaphorical or a physical place in the city of New Orleans. Okay, so I do think I've actually heard about this. Like, I, I mean, this is something... I mean, it's kind of a trope you see in, like, horror movies anyway. You know, the gates, ancient gates buried within a town. And, like, I'm pretty sure New Orleans came in there somewhere, but... I mean, it's multiple... Le- it's You can get to the underworld through these places. It's it's like the, the Orphiric Cave or, you know, the, the caverns or anything else that were in China that you could find to get down to the realm of King Emma. You know, those those kind of things. There's always, in lore, there's going to be a way to find their, your way to the afterlife or down to the uh, the underworld. And, uh, yeah, right now I think that's called Denny's in America for a lot of for a lot of us. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hashtag not sorry, I'm a Waffle House boy. We haven't been to the Waffle House next to our house yet. I don't know how good it is, but it's right across the street from a Denny's. You need to try the Waffle Are you talking about the one out on, well, uh, like, way out on something road? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're going to bleep this anyway. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, if 
It's like, oh yeah, I'm in. I'm gonna bleep that. No one's gonna hear that. You won't hear it at home unless you have like magic to unedit everything. If you do, don't do that, please. Yeah, please don't. Please, I mean, we're, I, we're just I, the voice that you hear right now. Chris has worked so hard to make me sound good. Shit, I, I, I don't sound like this normally. This is this is all Chris's editing magic. This is how he sounds naturally. <laughs> anyway, so uh, they're either a metaphor for death or they're an actual place. So, with the metaphor, uh, the soul stays near the body for seven days. Uh, so one week after you die, you, you stay near your body in the voodoo faith. Now, this is the greatest risk time period that you can become a zombie. So you pass through these gates with Baron Somity to make sure that your body, one, your body's good after a week, and then you walk with them through these gates, all seven, to get to the afterlife. Okay, so so basically he just walks with you. It's like, hey, you're, you're, you're coming with me, buddy. Yeah, pretty much. Now, also there's a, I didn't find a ton on this, but there's also a chance that these seven gates are also kind of connected to the stages of grief and mourning. Oh, that's cool. I so, like that. Uh, but I didn't find a ton of information on that. Now, the one, the one that's fun, the one that is a ton of fun, is that uh, the gates of Guinea are a real place. They physically exist, and they're scattered among the cemeteries and monuments of New Orleans. So, uh, they believe that, some people believe that Canal Street passes through all of them, or passes near them. There was a sinkhole recently. Well, I say recently, <laughs> like five years ago, but... But the thing is, is if you go down Canal Street, you do hit a lot of the cemeteries that used to be more towards the outside part of the city. The, the reason that I kind of took it with a grain of salt from the Atlas Obscura is they're talking about Canal Street being this big thing for so long in New Orleans. I'm like, you realize the reason Canal Street's called Canal Street is because there used to be a canal, a canal there. I, I'm not saying because bodies of water going through gateways is also symbolic of death. Yeah. Uh, but... It's one of those, I, I was kind of like, hmm, Atlas Obscura, I'm being a skeptic here and being an asshole. But what you're supposed to be able to do to find some of these is you take Somebody's Vivi, or his, his crucifix, uh, is what some people call it, but the Vive, or the Vive, or the Veve, or the, I, I'm mispronouncing it one way or the other, but his symbol. And there are seven stars on his symbol, and that if you line them up using Canal Street, with the lines of his of his sign, you suppose it will be able to find where each of the seven gates are located, and that you have to start at a canal and basin with putting it on. Okay, so he sent you on a quest to get to the afterlife. This is the amazing race now. You got to do all this bullshit around the city. No, 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 no. It's, Am I... you, no, it's if they do exist as physical places that can access. Guinea, then uh -oh, baby. Th this is where they are where they are on the map. Like, mm -hmm. if you line up, you can physically find them so you can physically go to them while you are living, not just pass through them as the dead. Oh, so this is a way to access. Okay, I, I'm, I got lost. Now, here's uh, some of the interesting things. Uh, each of the gates, you have to pass through them in the right order, and you have to treat each gate respectfully if you're trying to actually go through it and do anything uh, spiritual with it or else you're going to let out bad spirits that could drag you to hell for lack of a better term or drag you into guinea and then you never get out or you will release bad energy out into the city and around uh, so, you don't want that so you must you must show respect to each of the gatekeepers you must perform the correct ritual and you must go through them in the right order now uh, Marie Laveau is uh, listed as putting the gates in order and who are their guardians. So the very first one is the youngest of the barons, Baron LaCroix. I love and, LaCroix. And I'll talk about him here in a minute. Don't, uh, I'm going to go, like, here's the deal. Again, skeptic, the Loa are something I don't mess with. I was talking about the drink, LaCroix. I, I know, but I'm not going to disrespect Baron LaCroix by comparing him to Strawberry being yelled in another room with water in the room I'm in. Liquid death is better. Y yes. Uh, and then there is... Guide Nebo is the second gate. And then the third gate is Guide Plumage. Then there is the gate four is Baron Sumatre, the next of the barons. And then there is Guide Barbes. I hope it says Barbes. I'm hoping I didn't 
or Barbaco, Barbaco. my handwriting's terrible. Uh, and then you get to the two most serious of the barons. Gate six is Baron Criminal, who I will talk about again here in a minute. I'll talk about all the barons here in a minute. And then the last gate is Baron Samadhi himself. You must make an offering to each of them, and you need to know what is their favorite item to put in that offering. And some of them are as simple as, like, hand somebody a glass of rum, or in the case of Baron Criminal, light a black rooster on fire. That That's surprisingly hard and easy at the same time. While it's alive. Yeah, well, I... With the name... Like, I, I would expect with a name like that, you know. And I'll get into him a little bit more. And it, uh, and that's not the case with everything with the Barons. Like, these are just some of the ones that popped up most stereotypical. Uh, now, the easiest way to get access to these gates, if you manage to find them, is do it on a holiday. Okay, uh, so if it's And most like, of them are the Christian holidays. So if it's like... Christmas, like, All Saints Day... Or, yeah, like Passover, stuff like that. Or is Passover... Pa- Passover is uh, Hebrew. Hebrew. I'm... Easter, like, I'll, any of those major Christian days, plus there's like Planting Day, and there's a couple other... You uh, can holiday. tell I haven't been to church in a while. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so those those are the gates. And uh, my thing is, is that several of the places that are listed as being a gate, there are physical places... And uh, I've gotten to go outside of two of the cemeteries because you're not usually allowed to go inside in, in them anymore. Like uh, mostly because they don't even like they don't even have available plots anymore, do they? Uh, well, the thing is, you got to wait for somebody to die, and then they dump them into the bottom of the ostuary, and then you can be put in. Like it's you buy them from the city of New Orleans, and it's super expensive. Nicholas Cage owns five. All right, yeah. I mean, he is a vampire, so he's going to need multiple houses around the city and different mm-hmm. like dump spots for anything. I mean, he is literally a vampire. He plays Dracula. That is true. But in any case, it's I've been outside a couple of the cemeteries where these are supposed to be at uh, because, well, I mean, it was at the tail end of, I don't know, when, the last time I did a ghost tour, it was uh, just before COVID hit. But there, there were restrictions on where you could travel in the cemeteries because uh, people are jerks. The big thing here is that People do stupid shit in the cemeteries at New Orleans. Like, very rarely do you actually get to go see Marie Laveau's tomb anymore because people, the the, the actual practitioners go and put their marks on it to pay respect like they do over at her shop. Yeah. But then other people try to write stupid. This is how you get yourself cursed and haunted, and I don't feel bad for you as if you go mess with Marie Laveau's grave. Yeah, like me as a skeptic seeing someone do that, I'm like, oh, that's I'm, a good way to... I'm getting away from you. Yeah. Uh, like, I don't believe in this necessarily, but w- it, on the case it happens, I'm not going to be near the lightning well, strike. Well, the whole idea of Louisiana skeptic, like, I don't really believe in it, but I'm not going to test it. Yeah. that, that yeah. Very much so. Everything that is supernatural in Louisiana. I don't necessarily believe in you. I'm not going to try to disprove you, though. Like, anyway, so... Uh, but I, I've been to some of these places, and there is a weird energy. But, I mean, you could write that off as, oh, you went on a ghost tour. And there's, like, yeah. yeah. And, and you're going to an older area with a lot of history and a lot of, Also, like, let's be honest. A, like, you go to a cemetery. Me, I'm weird. Cemeteries don't freak me out. Hmm. I mean, for the most part, they are very well-manicured lawns with stone ornaments. That That's pretty much what they are. I'd rather be cremated and have my ashes scattered and allow somebody able to plant a tree there and grow food or have a farm. Yeah. That's me personally about cemeteries. But, I mean, they're pretty. They're nice. They're okay. I'm not freaked out about a cemetery because nothing's coming up. Yeah. And if there's a ghost, it can't actually hurt me. <laughs> but you go to New Orleans and the graves are above ground. And so if you do walk by there, like even if you're just walking past the wall, the walls have tombs on the other side of them. Yeah. So there's a bit of a there's a dead body like on chest to head height on you hmm. on the other side of this six inch wall. So like it gives you a weird energy. So I get that maybe that's maybe that's a little uh, off putting. Well, I think like a lot of people would feel the same way just with normal graves. But I, I mean, I guess the a normal grave is about six foot down. So. Yeah. But, I mean, the thing is, is that. I'll be honest, the ghost tour I went on was run by our friend Cedric, uh, who's now doing ghost tours in Gettysburg. 
And I mostly hung back with him laughing at the Marine, the drunk Marines that were there trying to scare themselves. So I, I kind of laughed at that. But I'm not going to lie, the, the three cemeteries we went to, including the Potter Cemetery where the Katrina Memorial is, uh, definitely give off some of the weirdest energy. I mean, I would imagine. Like, I've ever felt. And also, this is me because we got to go to Potter Cemetery. Is there's no markers there? There's just people buried, maybe twelve inches under the ground there, which means I stayed on the sidewalk. Other people just sitting there. I was like, you don't walk on a grave, and th- this that might be a superstition to talk about in a later podcast. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's always something, and and it's something I don't do is like, I don't walk on graves. So those are the gates of Guinea. Uh, there's a little bit more information I could go into, but. It starts getting more into a religious uh, note, and I'll be honest, I don't feel like that's the the main focus of the podcast, yeah. is we're, well, we're looking at more of the supernatural element and... The legend. Legend aspect, yeah. but also, I don't really want to, like, me try to explain, like, yeah. a dev- like I've got some stuff in here, and I'll mention but bits and pieces. The thing but... about voodoo and hoodoo is oftentimes it's explained by outsiders, are people that want to look at it as a spectacle. Right. They, and they, they look at, like, it, it's kind of like, I, as a kid who grew up watching Discovery Channel, like, you remember the old Natural Geographic and old Discovery Channel, like, uh, documentaries about, like, people that still live more tribally, like, in Africa and uh, parts of Southeast Asia and out in Polynesia. Yeah. Kinda like, they always tried to make it look so exotic and so wild and so, like, primitive. I... I get tired of that type of explanation people give for everything instead yeah. of like treating it as a equal or treating it with the respect that it deserves. Yeah. And and something with this, I mean, we can definitely get into a little bit of this because a part of it just kind of interwines with like local legends. But yeah, definitely. Like I, I definitely don't want to do like a super, like I wouldn't mind talking about the Loa themselves, but I don't want to get like into the actual practices of the religion. Yeah. So uh, the, it, it's like us and like Native American stuff. Like right. really, it's interesting, and there is a lot of history and a lot of culture in this area. Honestly, like this area in terms of Native. I'm sorry, I'm going on a rant, but going into like Native American history in the South is something you never really hear that much about. It's usually like plains tribes and everything. But I don't, I don't think I'm good to talk about it. I mean, it, we could look into that, but that's more of a history, that's more of a religion, that's more of a cultural thing mm-hmm. when we're looking at spoopy monsters. Yeah. When, and well, not just that, but also things that go bump in the night, things that are unusual. So we don't necessarily want to take that more. We, we don't want to step outside that wheelhouse just yet. Yeah. Like, I mean, like I said, I'd love to, like, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Loa here for a second. And I wouldn't mind addressing the Loa or having a series where we talk about one in particular. So you want to address the Loa? respectfully yeah if, you if want to go up to the low and be like hey respectfully see when you say that all i can think of is uh talladega nights with respectfully kiss my balls don't say that to yeah. baron somebody no, no, no. i'm just saying it's like that's you can't just get away with saying whatever but i said respectfully no, you, you can't you can't do that like anytime i hear respectfully like all i can think of is will ferrell in that movie but, you can only you can only really do that to baron if you're if you're saint germain I don't even think he'd pull it off, but uh, let's let's go ahead and talk about Baron Somedy. So, first off, to understand what Baron Somedy is, is Baron Somedy is a is a Loa, and the Loa are defined as either powerful spirits or lesser gods uh, in the pantheon. Uh, they all represent a aspect of uh, a, of a single god known as Bonyi, or at least the site that I went to said that. So they have like a there's one big god, and then they're all cut. Kind of, like the whole thing with voodoo is it takes West African religions and Catholicism and has a syncretionism together. So you, you take Anansi the spider and you take St. Peter, you put him in a cup and shake him up and Baron Somedy rolls out. Smoking, yeah. Smoking a cigar. So, but I mean, the big thing is that they all, uh, Bonyi is the kind of their overall creator God and it's kind of the clockmaker, like the clockmaker theory, God makes the world and then Just, not yeah. deuces. And walks off like, it. Uh, when I got to wind you, I'll wind you, kind of thing. Like, I'm not directly involved. You're smart enough mm-hmm. to handle this on your own. So, so the Loa are basically... They, they kind of, 
they're similar to saints in a sense. Like you ask them to intercede on your behalf, mm-hmm. and you ask them for favors. Yeah, I was. But thinking. they also have their own aspect to where they are spirits, or they might be their own gods. And also at the same time, I have heard multiple definitions going to New Orleans and from other people and from a professor I had in college that uh, this was what he studied, and that it's kind of like uh, with like neo paganism. There's there's levels of it that are people are doing their own thing within kind of a loose guideline. Yeah, what I was thinking is the lower the lower are kind of like these avatars of the god. They're, like, they're kind of aspects or angels. It's yeah. a similar concept, yeah. Yeah, I figure you mentioned this uh, being as kind of like out of the way, doesn't interfere, but has like these emissaries that might act on their behalf. Yeah. Now, uh, the thing is, is Baron Samadhi's name literally translates to Lord Saturday. That's a badass name, actually. Lord Saturday is, like, a really cool name. I expect, like, it's going to be in a D&D campaign sometime soon, I feel. Yeah, just just that name, you know that dude is awesome. Yeah. Just fun to be around. Well, so, on that note, he can be. But the thing is, is Samadhi is the most well-known of all the Loa. Mostly due to voodoo being used in tourism for New Orleans. Hmm. But also, he is uh, a Gidi. G-H-E-D-E, I, I think I pronounced it right. Uh, he is the head of the Gidi family within the Loa Pantheon, and he and the Gidi are always associated with death. So one reason that you might hear more about Samadhi than Dembala or even Papa Legba is that the Baron is an inevitability, re- or represents an inevitability, mm-hmm. is the force of inevitability, because one of the few things that every one of us has to acknowledge is at some point, Mortality. Mortality. Is going to, unless you're, you know, St. Germain, then apparently mm-hmm. you can find loopholes through that, either the mm-hmm. Philosopher's Stone or becoming a vampire. Um, or becoming a legend. Or, yeah, living living throughout the years as a legend that will never be forgotten because eventually someone will make another story about a crazy dude like you. Mm-hmm. Uh, but also, he one of the things that's very odd is uh, his wife is Maman Bridget. And uh, with a lot of the Loa, they're known as Papa or Maman uh, you, you give them that honorific of father or mother unless they're the baron. And then you call them baron. baron. Like there's Papa Legba, the crossroads, and the, the intermediary. You have, for the most part, I've not heard Dambala called Papa Dambala. But also the only other thing I've really heard Dambala mentioned in is Child's Play uh, with Chucky. And I'm pretty sure Dambala's mad about that movie. Um, yeah, I, I'm sure that wasn't a... A considering that's accurate not, depiction and that's also not what he's associated with i don't believe yeah. uh, I, I will do some research on that because uh i i, I Are, have the, the research dread. as in watching child's play no I thank don't. god i don't like that movie it's uh i i the lower are very important for the the dresden game that i run for my wife uh and, and christina uh that they run uh in a dresden fates well it's now we're switched to monster of the week because the amount of power they had in fate just had me nauseous because they could generate 52 shifts between the three of them in one action. That's always fun. Uh, considering a nuclear bomb is 22. Hey, you know... Here, here's an extinction-level event, DM. <laughs> if, you're, if your players can do it, if it's in the rules as written... I know. It's just that it, it's one of those that I could not... Uh, we had to switch systems for simplicity for me. Because mm. Monster of the Week is great because uh, I don't have to do... Much. I, don't, I, I am I am reactive in everything. But in any case, uh, I, I use them and I've done a little bit of research into them. But the thing that's interesting is Maman Bridget is more than likely sync- a syncretionism of either a Irish female saint or possibly of a female Duath Dinna. Not Duath Dinna. Uh, yeah, this is Duath Dinna. The, the, uh, the folks that were like uh, that Ludd and uh, Nuwata we're all a part of like in the Irish folklore that might be a they might have absorbed a folk tales from Ireland about this goddess or hero-esque individual and so I mean that would make sense like just in this area there's a lot of Irish immigration in New Orleans and like a lot of people don't really realize you see the Creole which is like African French that's what people focus on uh, but in the north part of the state there's mostly british no one gives a shit but there's a lot of irish and italian 
Like, well, I mean, the big thing, you also have New Orleans, you have the Irish Channel. I mean, one of the most famous sandwiches from the state is the muffaletta, which was made by folks from Italy. Yeah, it was made by uh, Italian, Italian dock workers. Dock workers. Uh, but here's the deal is, this is the odd thing about Maman Brigitte in most tellings. Maman Brigitte is white, making her the only white Loa that mm-hmm. I know of. And she is a hoot because where Baron Samadhi is always smoking and drinking and has a skull painted on his face, she's doing the exact same thing and they're having a blast. Oh, I thought you were going to be like, oh, they're like opposites. They're like no. buddy cop. Okay, so they're kind of like... Well, that is kind of an Irish Irish thing right there. I can but say that. I'm now, Irish. Now, to uh, to describe Baron Somedy, he is usually described as a very tall, dark-skinned man wearing tailcoats, a top hat, and with a skull painted on his face. Or, instead of having a skull painted on his face, it's just a skull. Similar to the Grim Reaper. He either wears black or purple. And he is hardly ever seen without a glass of rum or a cigar. So two of the things, if you were to make an offering to him, would be to have rum or a cigar or tobacco. And if you want to talk to our buddy LeBlanc, somebody messed with an offering left beneath a samedi tree in a cemetery. And that ghost tour got weird. Really? <laughs> talk, talk to LeBlanc about that. I can't do, any, I can't do it uh, justice. But also, he's at Wasteland right now, so you're not going to get a hold of him for like two weeks. Oh, Oh, definitely not. No, he, he's having a blast out in the desert. Well, he can have fun in the desert. I, I'm just glad it's not over 100 here anymore. Oh, I, I'm with you now. Also, he, he shares a lot of the same characteristics as Thanatos and Hades. He is both the Lord of the Dead, but he also has power over them. Mm-hmm. Like, he is, he controls death. So, like, Thanatos is the psychopomp of death. Hades is the Lord of the Dead, but he's not necessarily... Like he's not, Death. yeah. Hades is like the lord of the underworld. He's not. He's like a regulator. He is the in bureaucrat that, that has to deal with all that stuff. Whereas Thanatos is more like a grim reaper figure. He is very much an erratic and an erratic personification of death. Like he he is eccentric to say the least in most descriptions of him. Now, the big thing is he also decides who lives. Or dies. Like, he is literally the one that's sitting there and will pluck a string. Uh, Now, that being said, he tries not to mess with children in most lore. Because he thinks they should have a long, happy life. Until they make him mad when they're an adult and he no longer cares. Now, the biggest thing is he is not a psychopomp. He is not simply there to guide you, like, through the gates. He is... He will guide you through it, but he controls them in the gates of Gien. Or, again. The big thing is he also does not like zombies. Which is... Like, at least he does not care for anything that would fall into an undead category because it's a mockery of what it, It's it a mockery of the cycle. So, yeah. But at the same time, it's also said that if you make him mad, he will tell a warlock where you're at. He's one of those people that's like, I ain't going to do it myself, but I know someone that can. And Don't fuck make, with me. And if you make me mad. Now, the big thing is also... Uh, if you want to, anybody that starts doing like a, when, like the, any movie that has a voodoo practitioner, they're going to talk to the dead. You must make, um, you must make a contract with him and you must make him an offering because if not, he's not going to let him out. Uh, so he's like that. And his gifts that he prefers are coffee, rum, and cigars and chicken. Oh, but yeah. here's the deal is like if, like most of the Loa, if I said chicken, it would be something there, but I think that's mostly because as the religion developed, chicken was always a easy animal to get a hold of. You, you see that a lot everywhere. Anywhere. Mm. But uh, so th- there are other barons that are sometimes considered aspects of him and sometimes considered their own individual. It, there's very much kind of a Hinduism vibe here to me mm. because all, Where the, all the, of the gods are, are all the characters are aspects of right. one. All the gods in Hinduism are a aspect of Brahma, or Brahmin. I think it's Brahma, the the great will or the great life force. And then even those deities have other aspects of themselves that are separate individuals, but are still part of. Like Shiva has three, and because there, there are three lesser gods of death, that I think or destruction, they're connected to Shiva. I, I haven't looked at to into Hinduism uh, a lot recently, but I know that there are multiple deities that are aspects of other deities. So, and I kind of get that vibe. You get some of the other barons. You get the youngest of them, which is Baron LaCroix. He is always depicted as a younger, uh, well-dressed, a lot of times lighter-skinned African-American man. He's sophisticated, he's cultured, and he finds death humorous. He's very sardonic and philosophical about things, which I guess that's all of us in our 20s. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, and he usually says, enjoy, he, he's there to tell you to enjoy life, to partake. Like, if you could have one more, have one more. If you can go out and do the thing. So he's hedonistic. Oh, not so much hedonistic fully, as he's going to say, enjoy it to the fullest. But he also represents death in the present, which makes sense with the, you know, live for the now. And then you get uh, Baron Sumatra. He is the guardian of graveyards. He's usually depicted as a very large, muscular, dark-skinned man that wears a suit. And a top. All the barons have a suit and a top hat. Uh, oh, that's... In fact, Sumatra is so classy, his horses have tuxedos. Oh, hell yeah. yeah tuxedo horse. But he can... The thing is, he will welcome you, and he's usually depicted as also having a shovel. Because he is the gravekeeper and the grave digger. He is also known to be, just like almost all the Loa, to be both classy and... And crass. So it's how many of us? Everybody likes to dress up nice sometimes, but we also know what our humor is. Yeah. It's one of those. And it's kind of a running theme with the barons that they look very well dressed. They look very well put together, but then they'll make like a fart joke or they'll laugh at something that's not necessarily funny to everybody else. Like they laugh at death, which I get. I, I personally get that myself but i mean what the darwin awards is a thing that we have i mean it's it's pretty common to laugh at death in a sense well it's not but, even just it's not even that like like he might make a joke like if you died of pneumonia well you should have worn another scarf you know or maybe that jacket would have been good you know he makes mm -hmm. jokes like or maybe don't walk in the rain in february yeah, he'll make jokes like like he'll make a joke about how you died that would be like for the most part just uncouth and uncultured and unnecessary but he makes it funny and classy at the same time like it's one of those like i can't be mad at you type situations it's like fuck you but that was funny pretty much now uh the other one then you get to criminal criminal is mostly worshipped in west africa and haiti criminal really didn't make it into new orleans for very long because of how some of the followers of criminal does things or okay so at the beginning of this i'm forgive my like misunderstanding of like etymology like what does his name mean uh well his name is spelled sometimes it's spelled criminal and other times it's spelled with a k okay uh i didn't look really into yeah it, but it, it's associate you can make the association based on the criminal and criminal because he is to be feared because there is a chance that he was the first murderer condemned to die and became oh. Loa. I thought he was just a rowdy boy. Uh, some depictions have him as just a rowdy boy. There are some worship ceremonies of him that I that got outlawed because it involved knife fights. Oh, damn. Not, not to kill. Just... Just some knife fights. Just some knife fighting. Also, one of the ways to worship him is to set a black rooster on fire. Because its squawks are supposed to summon him because he enjoys pain. Okay, okay, so that's like that's a bit dark for he, you know. He is he is kind of represents violent death, and he's usually the Baron. A lot of people, especially here in the U.S., do not really want to bring up. And if someone out there is a practitioner or understands this a little bit better than what my research in a couple years and of papers that I've read years and years and years ago when I was in college. Uh, if you want to correct me, please do, because I would like to know more if I have learned something wrong. But now all four of the barons are have symbols that are usually black coffins, black goats, black roosters, and skeletons. Some things that almost universally are connected to death. The rooster is weird to me. Like, I don't pick up the rooster being a symbol of death. I get the black goat because, you know, you also got Baphomet and mm. even symbol or symbolism. Well, Baphomet's kind of, I like ba Baphomet's. Ba Baphomet's, okay, let me go ahead and put this up. Baphomet's an artificial creation from the late 1800s. Yeah, but, but, but the symbolism of the goat has been around for a long time. Yeah. Now, here's the deal is that um, Baron Somedy of all the barons has had the most appearances. And even even if you watch the the, the, the uh, America Horror Story that was set in New Orleans, they have Papa Legba, but Papa Legba appears like Somedy. Papa Legba is not meant to be that scary from the research I've done on him. 
And they really, they use Legba because Legba is the crossroads. And everybody wants to talk about the crossroads demon, the crossroads devil. Yeah. And so they making a deal for right. something. But other depictions of him that are actually more direct and a little bit more accurate is Dr. Facilier from Princess Frog. He wears a purple suit, top hat, and when he does some of his magic, he has a white skull on his face. So he is very much, the Shadow Man is very much influenced by Baron Somedy. Also in the James Bond movie, Live and Let Die in 1973, Somedy makes an appearance. And uh, President Duvalier, here's, here's a weird one. President Duvalier of Haiti in 1959 claimed to be the reincarnation of the Baron. That's a that's a bold claim to make. Here's the deal: we've had some wild years here recently in the United States. Wild years. Um, our president has never claimed to be the personification of death. So you know, like that, that's one of those things. If the president said that, like if they were just like, yeah, um, like what would be a good? I, I am the Reaper. I am Thanatos. I have come here to direct you in the correct way. Like I'm I would not, be like that. Something's got to happen here. Something we need to like have him not in power in did, did a some, legal way. Did my, my response is: Did somebody not give him his meds? That too. That I, too. I feel like that for like most of the last, mm-hmm. at least three out of the last five. I felt that. Oh, right. there's many years. But in any case, it's it's one of those of like we haven't had that level of crazy happen yet. But so yeah, that's uh, that's the gates of Guinea and Baron Somedy, and uh, I could go way more into him, and we might later because, like I said, I would kind of like to touch on the Loa because they are connected to so many stories, but not necessarily go into the really like I might have to like do some research, like find stories that actually happen, like because uh, there are folk tales that involve mm-hmm. them, and I think that would be kind of fun because you can see where their where their influences and what they are because I mean. I mean, one of the fun one of the fun theories out there is that that uh, Robert Johnson at the crossroads didn't make a deal with the devil, but he made a deal with Legba. Oh, that would be nice! Like just to uh, get into some of the different lore and everything. Yeah, there, so there there are beliefs that that's the case because here's the deal about Legba: he's described as a middle height man who wears a straw hat, but if he ever takes a straw hat off, depending on the story, he has small goat horns that are mostly hidden by his hair. So there's a chance. Ah, uh, uh, oh. so that'd be interesting to see. So how does I was gonna ask like you know okay so there's like this creator deity and I know we're getting near in the end. Mm-hmm. Like does it does this have like a duality much like Christianity does? Um, or to my understanding, not necessarily. But I have to do more research on that because I mean there are aspects of Catholicism all throughout. Yeah, yeah, that because it, it it's a com it's a combo. Yeah, because I've always known like voodoo and hoodoo to be not the same because obviously it's just something that has influences, but there's a lot of parallels but between that and Catholicism. And I was always like I never hear about like a lot about like bad things, but there's not like the ultimate struggle of good and evil like you see in like abrahamic religions where it's there's god and then there's either there's satan or there is a force of evil or there or or like if you look at the old testament like the old testament like ball is a thing but ball is not as powerful as the hebrew god in the way they wrote their book or the wrote the wrote the old testament so yeah i always figured it was like they mostly like sin and like evil itself was just like a force that was out there I don't know. I, I like to prescribe more to the Enlightenment way of thinking that we're all naturally good than go with the other way that we're all naturally bad. Oh, okay. Well, you know, I can I, I want to be a glass. I want to be a glass half full, but I will accept the mentality of at least I have a glass. Yeah, true. But that's getting off the subject. Thank you, Hewitt, for this really good thing. I actually yeah. did learn a lot. Like, like it's it's fun, and actually looking it up, like I was surprised that was obscure. I had as much as it did and that a website that i ancient origins i was like okay i'm about to find some like alien stuff no it actually turned out to be fairly decent minus all the clickbait ads that were on the edge like reminding me of like the geosites day of the internet i mean that's how it goes like you roll the dice when you go past the third page on google dude this is the second link (laughs) (laughs) so uh thank you all for listening uh 
depending on when this comes out, we have Extra Life, which is November 3rd through the 5th. Uh, we are partnered with Batson Children's Hospital in Jackson. So any donations made between, well, now in September, all the way through uh, the end of December, December 31st, uh, all proceeds will go to the Children's Miracle Network and the money will go to Batson's to help parents pay off medical bills because no parent should have to worry about paying for bills or getting their child treated. Uh, so also, if you want to find us on the internet, you can find, uh, we're associated with Team Bonus Action. You can go to teambonusaction.com or you can go to Facebook, Twitter, not Twitter, Twitch, uh, Threads, Blue Sky here in the future. Hopefully soon, yeah. Instagram. Uh, and we are Team Bonus Action. Oh, and YouTube where you can find all of our, uh, all of our, well, mm -hmm. they're live plays, actual plays. Yeah, we do a lot of like, okay, our main thing is like D&D &D stuff. I mean, we're not like, we're not doing it for like anything else other than to have fun and just have an excuse to hang out with each other. So if you go to our YouTube, it's Team Bonus Action. Uh, you'll find all of our actual plays. They are technically actual plays. Yeah, uh, that's we why do I clarification on if they're actual plays. We do, we have like homebrew games such as a horror game we're going to be doing soon. We have our weekly game, which is one run by Hewitt himself. And we have we have a couple of other games coming yeah, we, out. We, we got a few. Uh, if if you're able, if this is put out early enough, uh, through the month of October, we'll be playing Into the Woods, which is a horror themed five uh, E game. Uh, we might have a Monster of the Week game run by myself. We might have a game run by uh, your brother. Hmm. Not sure how much interest hmm. is actually in that one just yet, but it might happen. Hmm. Uh, it, it it looks like a spoopy system. Hmm. But anyway, back to the main point is uh also you can find us on twitter as bonus underscore team or bonus underscore team yeah bonus underscore I was team about, i was about to do like we're, two years ago like we just i just threw us off this entire time okay, so let's redo it right, you can also find us on twitter at bonus underscore team and uh thank you all for listening and uh y'all have a good day or yeah, night yeah, or yeah. whatever you're at bon we bon we